Yes. So, uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Algebra and Logic Seminar here at the University of Denver, uh, virtually. So uh, today we have Valeria De Paiva uh, from Topos Institute speaking to us about dialectica comanoids. Uh, so take it away, Valeria. Well, thank you, Charlotte. Let's let's great. Let's let's see if everything works okay again. And full screen. So I hope you all see my slides. And I'm sorry I didn't say the logic and algebra seminar. It's a lovely title. I, I'll change that uh, as soon as I can. But um, it's it's a great pleasure to be here. And I, I want to start by thanking Charlotte again for the invitation. Um, Charlotte and I met in the for the um, AMS MRC, Mathematical Research Community, on Applied Category Theory earlier in 2022. And, and Charlotte and, and Jeremy kind of were extremely helpful because I got a bit ill and couldn't do all the stuff uh, in New York and, and Charlotte and, and Jeremy and, and, and everyone else, all the participants kind of managed to, to do an extremely good job of it. And I hope you're going to hear more from our group soon. But um, but today I'm kind of going to talk about something that we discussed over in the MRC, but it's not exactly um, one of the things that the groups were, were worrying about. So as you may have noticed, my title is Dialectical Commonoids. And I think that some of you might not know what dialectical is and what commonoids are. So I started by explaining myself on that. So dialectic in this case has nothing to do with Marxism or anything like that. It's just a philosophy journal in Germany, or in Switzerland, sorry, where um, Gödel, Kurt Gödel, uh, presented his dialectic interpretation. And, and the dialectic interpretation is a proof theoretical interpretation, um, which was, was Gödel's way of proving um, consistency of arithmetic. Um, just a sec, forgotten to set up the, the timer, cool. Um, and I will not discuss much proof theory today. Um, and I will concentrate on the algebra and hence I'll talk about the dialectical construction as an algebraic or more precisely a categorical construction. And, and I'll talk about what are some I sometimes sometimes call dialectical spaces that you can check it up on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. um, and the dialectical construction, as it, it is the main subject of this talk, so I will talk about it properly in that few few slides. But uh, you could think for the big, to to have just an intuitive notion, you could think about taking two objects of a category C u and x, and a relation between these two objects, which you can think of as being a map from u cross x to 2. And, and you have to kind of, for the time being, imagine, imagine a nice, a neat notion of morphism between these triples that, that I just mentioned, right? Two objects and a, and a map. And what I want to, to, to think about the dialectical construction is that it is a functorial construction that taking that takes any Cartesian closed category and applies this dialectical construction that we are going to discuss later to it. And oh, sorry, what what's two? What's two? Well, two. Good, good question. Um, except that I'm going to explain better later on. But two is just okay. the, the it's just the co-product of one plus one, one the terminal object. Uh, so you know, just think about sets, which is what you should do. You know, it, it just said alpha just says that either u is related to x, in which case we, we map it to one, or u is not related to x, and then you map it to zero. And so zero and one are the things that compose two. Um so you know what I want you to think about is I want you to think that okay, you give me a category C, and I kind of put and if it has the correct um assumption so it's Cartesian closed with extra finite finite limits and stuff if 
depending on what you want to look at it. There are other assumptions, but basically it's Cartesian closed. And, and then you then I give you your dial C like, like so. And I kind of tell you that this will have interesting properties. And what we want to do today is we want to see what are commonoids in this new category that we came up with and how they relate to the commonoids in C and what they can tell us about other possibilities that we have of modeling things. Now, I don't know, since it's a seminar of algebra, maybe this is a completely useless slide, but you know, some people might not know what a commonoid is. And, you know, maybe even you guys don't know much about a commonoid because monoids are very useful and very used in mathematics all the time and in computer science too. But commonoids are a little bit less used. Um, but for a commonoid, you just take the, the two diagrams that, um, that describe a monoid and you invert them. So again, if you want to have a very um, easy to think example, you know, you can think about a, a, a monoid as being kind of all the sequences built up from a finite set A, say. So, you know, you, you have a finite set A, you get sequences of things in that. And what a monoid has to have is a multiplication operation, which in the case of, of, of the sequences is just concatenating them, just putting two sequences together and then getting a new sequence. And it has to have a unity, an empty sort of uh, sequences and unity because you can put in an empty sequence to one side of uh, an empty sequence of concatenated with any sequence on this side or in this side is the same. It's just the, the sequence that you started with. And this multiplication has to satisfy some decent things with respect to associativity, which is what the other diagram. Oh, funny, this one doesn't get called. Ah, it does. This is what the other diagram tells you. So you kind of, you know, if you're a good category theorist or a good algebraist, you say, okay, this two diagrams define a monoid for me, and I'm going to invert the, the arrows and everything will be fine. But as I say, they are much less used at least so far. And on the other hand, there are many applications appearing nowadays. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about, about them today. But I will discuss them mostly coming from my, um, from my motivations, which are in categorical logic. So let's go to categorical logic. And um, I kind of, there's several different versions of categorical logic in the market, as they say. And uh, the one that I'm kind of fond of is categorical proof theory. And I think I thought I would put for you a, a, a quote from Martin Highland in his uh, paper on proof theory in the abstract in 2002, which kind of explains somehow this um, this idea of trying to do proof theory using internalized uh, category theory. So what he says is that elegant mathematics will of itself tell a tale and one with the merit of simplicity. This may carry philosophical weight, but that cannot be guaranteed. In the end, one cannot escape the need to form a judgment of significance. And I think the quote, you know, you might I mean, if you haven't seen much categorical logic before, you might not um, appreciate the depth of, of, of the conversation of what he's saying. But, um, but I, I hope you see some of it in, in what follows. So um, people who do categorical proof theory tend to be much more fond of constructive reasoning than classical reasoning. And that is because um, there's, there's several reasons for that. But um, one of the reasons that even classical mathematicians tend to think about is that the reasoning principles are safer. So if he, I ask you whether is there an X such that P of X, personally, I'm much happier with, with the answer, yes, the X is X not, this is the witness. Then with an answer of the form, yes, for all X, it's not the case that not P of X. 
I think the second uh, is much more roundabout and, and gives me a, a, a bit of a bad taste in, in the mouth, you know, something that you don't know exactly what is happening. So that explains that everything that I'm going to be doing here is going to be constructive as much as possible. And if I need to be classical, then I want you to tell me where it's been classical and why. So as I was saying, I want to discuss with you monoids, commonoids, and monads and commonoids in categorical logic and why they kind of become more interesting recently. And this is the, the main reason for that is the curry howard correspondence where um, the basic version of curry howard relates Cartesian closed categories, the ones that I was mentioning a minute ago, to intuitionistic propositional logic and to simply typed lambda calculus. And, you know, that's just a picture to keep on the back of your mind and feel sad that Bilovia died recently, kind of end of the this year. And I don't want to, to understand fully what um, what the Curry Howard correspondence is. I, I want you to just um, bear with me and think about um, think about writing natural deduction, but writing natural deduction proofs, but think of them as morphisms in a Cartesian closed category. So the main rules for implication are the two ones above it, right? If you have a collection of assumptions gamma and you have an extra assumption A and using all these things, you prove a T of type B, then you can abstract over your X and get a lambda X dot T of type A arrows B. And that means that A implies B in the context gamma. And similarly, you can apply, if you have a T of type A arrows B and you have a U of type A, then you apply T to U and you get a B. So what I'm asking, what sort of imagination I'm asking from you is to now read these things as uh, this T here is a, a morphism in a category from gamma product A to B. And uh, this U here is a morphism from collection of, of types gamma into A, and this is um, simply application of functions, and this is just abstraction of functions. And the fact that we have a Cartesian closed category just corresponds to some sort of deduction theorem in logic. And it just says that if A and B prove a C, that is if and only if A proves that B proves C. And, and you see, I, I kind of here had a gamma because when I'm writing lambda calculus, I kind of want to think about several different assumptions. But when I'm kind of thinking about category theory, I just get all the gammas into an A and, and think about morphisms of this shape. And please feel free to, to ask if things uh, disturb you for any reason. But I think this is all very traditional and it shouldn't... Uh, cause any problems. But then, so you, you, we have, sorry, just, just checking that, I guess I, I moved one slide too fast. So, you know, so far so good. As I was saying, very traditional stuff, you have deduction theorem corresponding to an adjunction in category theory, everything's hunky-dory. And, and it comes with extra things happening, right? For, for each object in the category C, we have an identity morphism. And whenever you have a Cartesian closed category, well, you have to have products and you have to have internal homes. And, and you also have a diagonal map that goes from A to A product A. And you have co-unit maps that go from A into A product one and A into one product A with the correct commuting diagrams that you kind of, if you look at them, you see that they are just the, the diagrams of the commonoids that we're discussing early on. So in a Cartesian closed category, every object is a commonoid with respect to the product, which more or less explains why mathematicians are not, were not very excited about commonoids be before, because every object has a, a, a commonoid structure. And it's even unique, which is something that people like the N lab and make a point of making. So it's a unique um, 
commonoid structure for each object. So this was not very exciting until um, until Girard, Jean Yves Girard came along in the mid eighties with this idea of linear logic, because um, this two. Um, maps that we're discussing here, the diagonal map, uh, sorry, three maps, the diagonal map and the two uh, isomorphisms, they actually mean when you're kind of doing this comparison to logic and moving in the in the curry hard to the logic side, this, this commonoid structure means that we satisfy the structural rules of weakening and contraction. Um, the way to see that is to read these two rules that are traditional in sequent calculus and, and in natural deduction in, in some ways. And, you know, that natural deduction in sequent form is what I'm thinking about. So you, you, you these two rules are very tr trivial, right, in logic. If you prove some B from gamma, then you can add extra hypotheses that don't do anything, that don't work. And if you proved a B using two copies of certain A, then you can prove it with a single copy because, because when you are proving things, you're using sets, you're not using um, sequences. You, you, you just kind of, you can, you can duplicate your formulas or, or kind of in this direction, uh, add them as much as you want. Now, when we move to Girard's linear logic, uh, he removed contraction and weakening from the usual rules of logic. And that was a good idea because it makes much easier to model certain features of the world. But the logic without these two rules is too weak. And to get back to, to a tra traditional logic, intuitionistic or classical, you need to use a modality that is normally written as an exclamation mark and read as of course. And contraction and weakening, the rules that we just saw, will only be available for those guys, for the guys that are in the image of this operator, bling or, or bang, or whatever you want to call it. And one of the things that was realized very early on is that this bling or bang satisfies the sequent rules or the natural deduction rules corresponding to the box or the necessity modality in S4. So we kind of start having um, common ads getting into our picture, which didn't have common ads or monads so far at all. And um, and then we we you know if we wanted to move to model linear logic, we have to provide this common ad. Mm -hmm. And what's important for us is that this common ad common ad has to generate commonoids because what we actually want for the linear logic stuff is that those guys that are the form playing A, they have natural versions of duplication and erasure associated to them. So another small digression here is the fact that um, modalities for a long time were not very, uh, they're not considered very serious in mathematical logic, right? Um, mathematical logic used to be much more about extensional logics, and that means first order logic and higher order logics. And, and even higher order is, it was, is somehow debatable in certain circles. But I, I wanted to uh, point out that Dana, Dana Scott in 1971 was already giving this advice on model logic that, you know, just because something can be translated into first order logic, it doesn't mean that you should not try to investigate and understand and mathemat mathematize uh, the phenomenon in the case, in this case, the phenomenon of modalities. So in this case, constructive modalities. And so that's what I am uh, doing at the moment. So let's think about, I mean, we just now we're thinking about Propositional logic is algebra, right? Kind of a categorical algebra or category theory. Now I want to think about modalities as algebra. So modalities are usually unary operators over, over a logical basis. And many logical bases are possible. You could do over linear logic, you can do over intuitionistic logic or classic logic or relevance logic or affine logic. There's lots of possibilities. 
And what, what is an interesting big problem that I'm not going to discuss so much today, but you know, I want to I wanted to put in front of you is this thing about which modalities are useful, which bases should be used, how we should consider um, more of these modalities, and why the logicians kind of think about so many modalities, how to choose between them. Kind of, you know, presumably we want to have things like for this, this, and that, this and that modalities are good, for this, this, and that other different modalities are useful. I wanted to, I always wanted to know about uh, what are the important theorems that we can have when we are insisting on this correspondence between lambda calculus, logic, and category theory. And of course, we also want to know what are the most useful applications. But today I'm being much more cons I'm being much more focused on something very specific because what I'm kind of trying to say to you is just that I can use modalities, which is this big problem that relates computer science and, and mathematics and philosophy. I want to kind of use these modalities just as motivation for thinking of commonoids. And um, so let's have a look. So the, the rules for the modality bank or, or, or playing in, in linear logic are the ones here. Um, so they say that, you know, I can only add a bank to a B if I proved B from everything being banked. And I, as I, I was saying a minute ago, for playing or bank A, I can do uh, weakening, I can add it to the to the sequence, and I can do um, contraction. I have two copies, I can have a single one. And I can also, um, I know that whenever I have a pling A, I can prove an A, because we always read these things uh, bottom to top when we are thinking about what the morphisms are. So reading them as morphisms in the category and kind of making the gamma be just a pling A as I did a minute ago and the B be the same pling A, then I have pling A proves pling A, then pling A proves add a bang on it. So I got two pling A's, right? So that's how I kind of see that that's the kind of morphism that I need. If my gamma on the other hand is empty, so I have B is a theorem proven, proven from nothing, then, um, and, and the B, sorry, if, the, if there's nothing here, so I'm talking about a, a theorem, something that's proved from nothing, but my theorem is just true, then I have this erasure because any playing game will be able to come in and prove the one. Similarly, uh, I have the this possibility of making this empty and having A proves A, and then I have the playing A proves A. And finally, you have the copy following the same sort of reasoning. So you see that the modalities here are divided into blocks, or at least I can think of them as, uh, as divided in two blocks if I'm using my category theorist hat, because um, this one and this one tell me that Pling A has to be a commonoid. And this one and this one are the natural transformations that you have for a commonad. So, and whenever you have a commonad, if you had your first course on category theory, which I've forgotten to mention this bit, then you, you have a, a category of Eilenberg more algebras for that. And the same thing happens for common ads and co-algebras. So this are the, um, these two rules tells you, tell you that um, you should have um, co-algebras of some sort, Eilenberg more co-algebras for this bling that I, I'm modeling to be a commonad. So, um, and, and you know, I just said what I'm going to say here kind of carefully because I've forgotten that I had this other slide. But yeah, you know, uh, 
each pling A has to be a commonoid with respect to the tensor product. So a pling A, I copy to get pling A tensor pling A, and pling A has a map to the unity of the tensor, which I called I because that's what category theorists do. But it would be called one or true in, in logic. And as I said early on, it's less obvious, but um, one way of modeling this logical structure is to have a co-algebraic structure. And so Pling A needs a co-algebraic structure where I now mean that, that Pling A is a common ad in the category that I'm using, the C. And moreover, these two kinds of structures, these two, uh, these four maps, they need to interact in a consistent and coherent way. And that's where things start getting interesting and complicated. Now, um, this is what we need if we want to model linear logic, right? And what I kind of was doing many, many, many years ago was actually saying, um, I have this notion of dialectical categories, the ones that I kind of vaguely introduced at the beginning, and uh, and they were good for modeling linear logic. And then more recently, this dialectical categories kind of came back to fashion, uh, and they are very much being discussed in, in Twitter and things like that, because um, they are connected to some other structures that are very, um, upcoming in, in computer science. And these structures are called lenses, containers, and, and polynomials. And most of this conversation, this recent conversation has been about um, the morphisms of the dialectical spaces and uh, the structure of the dialectical spaces. But the hard work that happened kind of many years ago was about proving that we that for the dialectical categories, we have appropriate commonoids and commonads. And, and so this is the, the, the story that I'm trying to tell today is, is you know, it's, it's about the commonoids and the commonads that, that we have there and how special they are. Um, so, so what, so back to the beginning, back to what dialectica really is. So dialectic is a very precise model of linear logic in the sense, precise in the sense that we don't collapse things that, um, that are logically different. And that's different from the most used models of linear logic that tend to collapse things. Um, so in the dialectic, all connectors correspond to distinct structures in the categories. And those many year, years ago, I had two families of models. Um, the, the ones that I'm discussing today, which kind of I kind of just called dial C before, but I, I'm now calling dial two C because um, where we had that two that Sashank asked about, we could have a different algebraic structure uh, to, to have a multi-valued sort of, of logic. But you know, I want to keep with true and false, and so I'm using true to model that. But there's also a more um, a more faithful to to the, the uh, to the linear logic um, inspirations. So a classical linear logic or a full intuitionistic linear logic dialectical category, which I'm now denoting by that. But uh, but we are not talking about that today. Now, you guys shouldn't, you, you guys probably know that, you know, what determines a category is not the objects, but the morphisms, right? Um, so there may, there might be, I mean, like for instance, sets and rel, are the, the objects are the same sets, but um, there's a huge difference between the categories because one has as morphisms functions and the other one has as morphisms relations. And these two are very different structures in the end. So the difference here between these two sets of models is again, a difference of morphisms because in the, in the, mod, in the model that I'm discussing today, the dial 2 c uh, the, the, the morphisms, um, um, oh, sorry, Morphisms, I'm going to see in, slide, in the next slide. 
but the objects are exactly the same. And as you, if if you remember when I first introduced them, I said that objects were U, X, and alpha, which was a map going from U cross X to two. But that in sets, at least in, in kind of specific kinds of categories is exactly the same as taking a subject, a sub object of the Cartesian product, right? There are two different ways of defining relations. You can define them as subsets of the full relation, or you can define them as uh, maps from U cross X into two or into true and false. Um, in any case, whether you want to discuss the one that I'm discussing today, which is the one that has the most beautiful common ad, or the other one that has a ugly but more useful common ad, uh, the different that both of them are symmetric monoidal closed categories with products. And that's important because this is one of the trends that has been happening in category theory is that, you know, people nowadays don't think so much about real Cartesian products, but they much prefer to think about tensor products. Tensor products do much more than Cartesian monoidal products. So um, this means that the result that I mentioned earlier on, that there is only one commonoid kind of stops happening. You, you can have lots of commonoid structures depending on which tensor you have. And while the Cartesian product is unique for a category, unique up to ISO, uh, tensor products, you, have, you can have plenty. So finally, we have the definition. Almost the end of the. I mean, we have a definition of the original dialectical category. So the morphisms morphisms are not a, a total and uh, totally easy because you you have to to create two pullbacks. Um, you you're going to say that um you have a two objects u x and alpha and b y and beta, and you're going to make uh you're going to say that there is a morphism between these two, if there is a pair of functions, little f from u to v and capital F, and capital F not simply goes back from y to x, but it can use the domain u. And this, two, this pair, little f, capital F, has to satisfy this slightly complicated um, pullback diagram. So, you know, you, you take your, your alpha, now thinking of it as a sub-object, you pull it across from pi 1 and f, capital F, and you get a sub-object sub here. Uh, you do the same thing for the other map, the, the map that goes from u to v and goes to, you pull back beta against this map. And so you get two different sub-objects of u cross y, and you say that this one is smaller or implies this one. And there's an awful lot that I could say about this um, diagram because, because first of all, you see that um, this kind of morphism is not the ones that we normally deal with in category theory, right? Normally, if you're doing dealing with pairs of, 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 of pairs of objects in a category, you, you normally think of maps going both in the same direction. Here we go one direction and the other, or the other one going upwards. Not only that, but um, if you're trying to think of this logically, you're actually saying that, you're trying to say that this object um, implies this object. And you could, instead of, thinking of implication, you could think about by implication. So you could say, okay, I do this pullback here and I do this pullback here and I have a map going from here to here and one going back from there to there. And that would mean would mean that um, that you have a by implication between, because this thing is supposed to, to represent internally a formula in higher order, I mean, in, in arithmetic. And so, you know, this and that you could think of, of them as being by equivalent, by provable, but I don't want that. I want just in one direction. And um, 
if you did this other stuff of thinking of them going in both directions, you could do that if your intuitions came more from topology, because then, um, well, that's that's what um, people did, uh, particularly Mackay, no, Mackie, um, that all topologists kind of did that to deal with functional analysis in, in, uh, in a categorical way. And that's the origin of the true construction, which is another big model of linear logic. Um, again, if you want to think about, uh, I, I can I can give more intuition about that if, about the other version in a, in a minute. So with with this notion of, of dialectical categories, the one that has just an implication, I can prove uh, what I wanted, which is that that this category, uh, the dialectical category of a C that uh, that has that's Cartesian closed and has finite products um, is a model of exponential free intuitionistic linear logic. But as I said, that was very easy. That was kind of, I mean, it's almost known by the category theorists before Girard invented the logic. The category theorists knew that that was the case. What was more exciting about linear logic was the business of being able to to go back and have at the same time this logic that's careful about resources and the traditional logic in the same setting because that's what the operator bang or plink does for you. It gives you back intuitionistic logic because you know if you now look only at the objects that have a plink in front of them, then you have the full intuitionistic logic at, at your disposal. So um, what is very surprising about this first model of linear logic is that, and that's only algebraists kind of uh, pay attention to, is that this common ad that we invented, and I'm going to show you down here, is a co-free common ad. And co-free structures are not exactly a that abundant, um, at least in, in mathematics, at least I don't think they are that abundant in mathematics. So there are many useful, well-known monads like exceptions, power set, continuations, but there are fewer known and loved common ads. And um, in this case, with this very strange notion of, of morphism going back, kind of fusing a little bit of the domain, uh, we, we, we define this common ad that it is, that kind of has co-free commonoids. So, you know, you do one of the things that would be obvious if you're thinking of logic, because in in uh, if you're thinking about brower heiting um interpretation, you, you think to yourself that um, proofs of a formula A should, in, if, you, if you're looking at proofs of A implies B, the proofs of the formula A should entail a proof of, of the formula B. So there's always a map going from the, the antecedent to the consequence, that's that's what it does, right? But what the dialectica has is a, a more exciting um, way of realizing implications because it has this idea that counter models, things that counter examples, things that, that make the consequent false also make the, the, the antecedent false. And the fact that you can do, um, the fact that you can create morphisms that look so uh, non-symmetric, but but satisfy this 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 notion uh, of um, satisfy this notion that to have a commonoid, you just do a monoid in the second coordinate. It's kind of surprising. So the main thing here is that to create this bang operator, to create this S4 operator that we want, we just do nothing in the first coordinate and create commonoids, create monoids, sorry, create monoids in the second coordinate because creating a monoid in the second coordinate means creating a commonoid in the whole object. So you take the free commutative 
monoid in C, or in, in the category C in X for, for this object here. And with that, uh, we recover intuitionistic and a posteriori classical logic within linear logic. So this, this is kind of cool because you have this free commonad in dial 2 c um, The tensor product on this category is, is very easy, very obvious. You know, you take two objects and you just make the product of the first coordinate and product of the second coordinate and the product of the relations. So it's as easy as you can get it. And this, the fact that this bang or this pling is a monoidal commonad, meaning that, um, that applying it in each coordinate has a natural way of transforming into applying to the tensor of the things. Uh, so that's that's what um, that's the monoid monoidicity of the commonad is, is this um, morphism, this natural morphism on this shape, and that it works okay for the unit too. It's it's just Turn in the crank. You just do the calculations. And it shows everything that you wanted to show. Uh, it's not a total obvious thing in some ways because, again, as I was saying to you, in the old way of thinking about categorical logic, where everything was products and co-products, you wouldn't expect uh, this sort of morphism. You you'd expect a, a congruence or, or an equivalence here, but it's part of the, this new tensor way of thinking about things that it goes in one direction only. And then, so you have your uh, induced commutative commonoid structure on, e on each object, pling of A, and this pling of A also has a natural co-algebra structure, and they interact in a nice way as we want it. And again, if you remember your, your MacLean on basic bits about category theory, you know that every monad uh, induces category of Eilenberg more algebras and co Kleisley categories, and 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 the same thing happened here. All dualized to common ads, co Kleisley, co um, co Eilenberg more co freeness. So we have this kind of situation where this is the dial 2C category, and that's the Kleisley version of the dial 2C category. Oh, so thank you. So, so the approach so far has been something like, I wanted to model a logical system, linear logic, and we know what's necessary for the categorical model, which is that, I mean, as I said, category theorists knew that before linear logic was invented, that the object should, should be form a symmetric one or the closed category. And um, the bit about how to model the modality, they did not know, but you know it was kind of clearly realized that you needed a commonoid and a co-algebra structure interacting nicely. And um, so all the previous work was to say, okay, I have a logic, I want a model, categorical model, what do I do? I do this. And, and in this particular case, it works really well because you, uh, not only you have a commonad that does what it's required, but it's also co-free. But you could change the approach, and that's what this talk was supposed to be about to begin with, because you you could um, you could just say that you wanted to think about commonoids in general, the same way that nowadays we think about tensor products in general. And um, what we could start thinking is. What are the other commonoids in, in this dialectical category in particular? And what can we say about the category of commonoids with respect to different tensors? Because that's what I was saying to you, you know, if you have the Cartesian product, there's a unique one, but if you're thinking about tensors, there are several. So, you know, what can we say about commonoids with respect to different tensors? That was what I want to discuss today, but, um, then I kind of started thinking, well, what have people done about that? And um, yeah, there are a few bits of commonoid structures 
in mathematics. Um, in 1973 or 73 already, Michael Barr had uh, co-algebras of a commutative ring, which where he describes um, modules that have a commonoid. So kind of um, generalizations of vector spaces that these are, and this case are, is a commutative ring that have a commonoid structure. There's some works on presentability of categories of co-algebras. Co um, there's someone called uh, Agor who has limits of algebras, co-algebras and Hopf algebras. So some stuff has been done about commonoids in general in mathematics more than I knew before starting to prepare this. But in any case, it's problematic because uh, sometimes they use co-commutative co co-algebra um, as a synonym for a co-commutative commonoid. And you see, the way I was presenting that, I kind of forced very much the idea that there were two different structures, that commonoids exist depending on a tensor product, whereas co-algebras exist depending on a commonoid on the category. So they don't have to coincide. They, they only coincide in specific special cases. But the literature is crazy because people then decide to use one name for the other. So my terminology comes from MacLean, old MacLean, uh, for categories for the working mathematician. Uh, but you have to be careful with some of the terminology on, on, on and the end lab. Uh, kind of confuses the two issues. More interesting, um, there is kind of nowadays several interesting new applications of commonoids, which kind of would push us in the direction of, of, of the second approach as that I mentioned to you. So there is this work on partial differential equations as co-algebras for the jet commonad. Um, which looks very interesting in this Russian work from the early 90s. Um, there's um, this whole work that um, that made the, 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 the MRC that I said that I, I met Charlotte on kind of important, which is this work on lenses in computer science and lenses and objects in computer science. Um, and there's just even more kind of recent work on uh, model categories and the work of Catherine Hess and um, Shipley on homotopy, homotopy theory of co-algebras of a commonad. These are kind of commonoid, commonoids and co-algebras in math. Uh, in particular, kind of going back to my commonoids, the commonoids that I was discussing with you in, in, in the dialectical categories, um, there's there is uh, commonoids in the two category, which is the, the stuff that I was mentioning about making the two implications, make, making instead of one implication, making implications by implication so that you have uh, asymmetric construction. And so um, a large Cartesian closed sibling of topological space by von Pratt is about commonoids in that kind of category. And there is also the stuff on polynomials, this, this paper on collectives, uh, which is work of Nelson New and David Spivak from, uh, from the Topos Institute, uh, which kind of rewrites the notion of commonoids in terms of um, this collectives, which are just um, ways of thinking about investing money and getting returns proportional to your contribution. So, I mean, I, I'm very, I, I think it's a very good thing, this ability to transform pure mathematics into something that speaks closer to people like collectives of investors. So, um, so I wanted to see uh, how much more of these applications we could do. But I'm afraid I did not manage to do this for for this talk. So I kind of I I think there's still quite a quite a bit to do relating those commonoids, which are very similar to dialectical commonoids, to those commonoids, which are also very similar to dialectical commonoids, but different in in, in the, I mean they're both 
are similar to the dialectical ones, but they are not so similar to each other, but, but similar still. And be, because the categories themselves uh, have um, have connections that have been explored by, by several people, um, myself, Mike Schumann, um, Dusko Pavlovich, lots of people kind of thought about how dialectical categories uh, interact with two spaces and interact with polynomials. And um, and I think I think I'm getting to my conclusions. So you know I promised you a story about commonoids in the dialectical construction. I only showed you one, but I have several others kind of if you want to, to know about. Um, they are in the other dialectical constructions, not in, in this one that has this special, especially neat thing about being a co-free one. Um, I could have called these commonoids linear modalities because they do correspond logically to mod S4-like modalities, in this case, over linear logic, but I, I, I could and have done that over uh, intuitionistic basis so that you can have a constructive model logic a traditional constructed model logic. Um, I showed you how dialectical categories introduce, well, I didn't show you different common ads. I only showed you one, but as I said, there are others. And I have not talked at all about constructive model linear logics or about constructive other logics that are not as for like, but, but they exist and it's an important area. There's much to say about this um, about constructive model logics because they are interesting for programmers, logicians, and philosophers. And it's that's because that's why I have something, I mean, I've been doing something called intuitionistic model logic and applications. There's a long-standing program with lots of results. And as I discovered trying to prepare this talk, there's lots to say about other applications of commonoids. Uh, there's some special in programming language, but I'm particularly interested right now on the ones that have to do with ordinary partial uh, e differential equations, which is the first one that I that of the logical ones that I mentioned, the one about the common the jet common ad. So there's also lots of categorical ways of thinking of differentiation, and I hope the commonoids in this particular case might give us a handle on that. And I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Oh, let's thank Valeria. Does, uh, does anyone have any questions? Do you have any resources on the, like you you mentioned the, the applications to programming. Do you have any like resources if I wanted to look into that? Um, yeah, kind of. There's there's loads of resources because you see, um, mind you, one of the things that I was trying to make is clear the difference between co-algebras uh, and commonoids, right? So for the co-algebras, there's a whole um, I a whole area of computer science nowadays thinking that co-algebras are the way to think about semantics of of programming language. Because they are about infinite, um, infinite data structures, so there's this this more than twenty years of CALCO, which is this conference on on algebras and co-algebras in programming. There's, I mean, the difficulty is to choose which one is the best for that because there are too many. Um, but on the so that is for co-algebras in programming language. Now for Commonoids in programming uh, in programming language, there's this this notions of lenses and and, and objects, which um, which are kind of ways of structuring functional programming. So um, so they are much less mathematical in some ways. You know, they are kind of written for programmers by programmers and. Um, and then the and then then the category theorists come and said, "Oh, look, you know this that you're doing here looks like um, a co-algebra to me." And 
And so there's a, a big interaction there. There's, a, again, another series of, of, of conference called BX for bi, uh, bilateral, no, bi, it's transformations, um, bijective transformations or something like that is the conference. I, I, I can dig out and, and give Charlotte a, a collection of these resources. So that, you know, there's an awful lot of that, but it's much less categorical. It's much less algebraic. It's, it's much more um, how people do things in the programs. Now, the tool that I kind of mentioned at the, la the last um, slide, the, the one of, you know, the slides have those two references are for, for let, let me put it, let me show you again, because then you can see in, uh, share. So these two, commonoids in shoe and collectives are kind of different notions of, of uh, I mean, you can, at least I think of them as being more computer science than than mathematics, because as as Nelson and David say immediately, you know, if you kind of know about commonoids, you know that they are commonoids for the, in this category of polynomials. But they kind of give a collection of ways of thinking about that, as I was saying, as how to return to investors uh, the the profits of of, of a collective. So. Um, and 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 commonoids ensure, despite the name talking about topological um, topological spaces, actually the stuff that von Pratt is doing with that is concurrence theory. It's kind of trying to to model how different computers can talk to each other, um, kind of in 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 a more um, trying to model model that so that you can provide assurances of of correctness and safety. So all these things are um, very much about computing and, and you know you, you just have to be careful if, you, if you're talking about the commonoids or, or the core algebras there will be different things now the one that i'm most interested at the moment is the last one a note on the category of partial differential equations from um uh, michael marvin i think i mean it's I, mean, I said russian but i i was lying sorry he's a czech it's just that uh the thesis is written in Cyrillic for some reason. I don't, I mean, I, I thought Czechs written normally write in, in, in Latin alphabet. I, I I couldn't read it. That's but but this the one that I'm putting here is the one that I could read. Um, it's in English. So um to me, that is the most exciting um application right now. But that is because, because in the MRC, we, we had four different groups. So there was uh, a group doing the category of polynomials, which has to do, come back, come back. I know you can come back. That has to do with the polynomials in this one. There's one group talking about lenses um, and um, that's, Charlotte organized a, a, a meeting on um, part of the JMM recently, and one of the guys from our group talked about that. So there's literature there. Um, and uh, sorry, there are four. So the polynomials, the lenses, um, the games, which I didn't mention at all, but connects more to the logic stuff. And finally, there's stuff that, that Charlotte was trying to do with, uh, is doing with Eric Bond, which is on, on these notions of, of concurrency. So using a particular uh, model of concurrence called Petronets. So, you know, you have loads of applications depending on what kind of thing you like. Thanks a bunch. My pleasure. Thank you for asking. <laughs>